Hello, and welcome to AppSec Decoded. I'm Taylor Armerding, security advocate with the Synopsys Software Integrity Group. And this is the fourth and final conversation in a series focused on threat modeling. And joining me again to help with that is Christopher Cummings, principal consultant at Synopsys, who is co-author of a recent paper, white paper on the topic. Chris, welcome and thanks again to you and your fellow authors for a paper that is both useful and available. Uh, if you're a viewer, you can download it for free at synopsis.com. And this series is covering the five major steps in creating a useful threat model, which are scoping, data gathering, system model, attack model, and risk analysis. Our previous segments, which are also available on our website, covered every step but the last one risk analysis. So let's get into it. As the paper says, risk analysis seeks to evaluate two attributes of a threat, likelihood and potential impact. What factors determine likelihood? Thank you, Taylor. And again, I appreciate you for, for having me here today um, and you know, wrapping up our, mm -hmm. our sessions. Um, first, before we dive into some of the risk analysis items, I'd like to acknowledge some of the team members, um, Sergio Santos, Lisa, and Dan Marvin Lupa, Mm -hmm. uh, and without this paper may not exist. So uh, a big kudos to them and, and the efforts that they put into this. So as we think about likelihood first, uh, the factors that we typically can conclude, um, include, I'm sorry, uh, are around access, right? So this talks about what type of access a person may have. Is this internal access? Is this physical access? Mm -hmm. um, is this something ex exposed to the entire internet? Those are going to range how easy it is for someone to actually execute or perform a, an attack on the system. Right. Sophistication. This really talks about difficulty. Is this a well-known type of attack? So brute forcing, as we kind of allude to in the paper, is pretty common. It's a thing that people do. There's dictionaries available for, for passwords. There's sites that are available that, you know, you can dump passwords out to try, right? So if you're talking about something like that, it makes it a little bit easier. Uh, motivation. This one's highly debated and, and highly um, contended in the sense that you can't really determine an attacker's motivation. But what you can determine a bit is, you know, is it assets that someone may be interested in? Yeah. Specifically a banking application. If mm -hmm. I can steal money, I might be a little bit more interested in that than stealing someone's picture. Right. Yeah. So I might be a little bit more highly motivated. Um, controls and precedent. Right. So are there controls we talked about previously? Are, is there a control available to stop me? Right. This also talks to the difficulty of, of the mm -hmm. attack and precedent as something happened before. Right. If there's a known history of known vulnerabilities or known attacks that you may have to, to, to bypass, these are all factors that are going to possibly increase or decrease uh, an attacker's uh, likelihood to, to succeed in, in an attack. Right, right. Okay, and, and you have six rankings of likelihood, ranging from low to high, highly likely to impossible. So explain those, right? I mean, I guess we all understand impossible, but explain <laughs> explain the other ones a bit along with how they can be used. Yeah, so I don't think it's necessary to dive into the specifics of, of highly likely, likely, somewhat likely, mm -hmm. you know, not likely, impossible, but let's think of it as a, as a whole system and relate back to the previous question, right? Okay. So if I have a system that is externally accessible, a common well-known attack uh, with no controls in place, I'm going to be much higher of a possibility to occur because sure. there's documented procedures and the ease of use and the available information is high, right? Yes. And so that's how we think about the scale. Okay. And impossible, uh, also again, thinking about, is it protected? Nothing is really impossible, but the, the, the likelihood is so low that we're not necessarily concerned about it. So if it's protected from an internal network, uh, not on the internet, only physically accessible to two people and you have to bypass you know, 18 doors, right? Let's yeah. call it impossible for the intentions of our paper. And sure. so that's what the scale is intended to do, right? It's intended sure. to provide some color to uh, what may occur. And as we think about risk, what we may want to prioritize a bit more. So it's likely that we're going to prioritize external threats a little bit more than something that's going to be internal, physical access and, and lockdown. Right, right. Okay, likelihood. And now, Impact. <laughs> what are the factors that help assess the possible impact of a threat? Yeah, so when we think about impact, um, we think about number of assets and scale, right? So am I compromising the system and getting one piece of data back? 
Am I affecting one user? Um, also, one of the things that's not mentioned in there as well is like financial implications might actually be sure. a thing as well too. If I if I take uh, uh, one piece of information, is that cause you know some financial harm to the company? Uh, you know, the sort of compromise uh, is it a compromise that allows me to gain full access to a mm -hmm. system or to a computer so that I have full read and write access, or am I just getting access to view it or um, maybe share it or uh, things like that? Am I just you know, affecting a single user, right? So thinking about okay. the types of attack that you would actually perform there. Okay. Um, availability, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if I knock down your system, does that cause financial harm? Does that cause disgruntled users that may want to switch to another platform or another um, place, right? Mm -hmm. So all of these factors really allow us to think about what is the impact to the to the application, but more importantly, what is the impact to the, the actual business? Uh, and there's a couple of industry specific things, you know, that we won't go into that to detail on that, but a big factor as well is business risk. So as we talk about in scoping and understanding the objectives of the application, the system, business risk allows us to determine what mm -hmm. may be a little bit riskier than, than others, right? Some uh, applications or some companies might find defacement of their website extremely impactful. So that's a thing that they might be concerned with. Another might be concerned with privacy of certain types of information. So that might be extremely impactful. Putting all of those factors together really shapes up, you know, what the impact might actually be. Okay, there, there's also an impact ranking scale. And basically, I mean, I, I would think for both uh, likelihood and impact, we're talking about something that will help you set your priorities, right? So ex explain the ranking scale and how that can be useful. Yeah, exactly. That, that's exactly what, what the goal is, right? So similar to, to likelihood, you're going to have, you know, um, an impact scale that talks about the damage, so to speak, of what that threat or successful threat might actually cause. Right. Where on the high end, you're going to have something like a critical, right? This is the most harmful thing that could actually happen to a system to maybe something like a negligible or informational or minimal, depending on mm. the, the model that, you, that you're using. Um, and I think importantly to, to kind of address what you're talking about, is the risk. So putting the likelihood and the risk together then helps you determine um, the likelihood and the impact, I'm sorry, together helps you then determine the risk. Yeah. And the risk can be used as a mechanism to prioritize, right? So yeah. if we have something that's highly likely and a critical impact to the company, we probably want to target that first and make sure that we have the proper controls in place. Where something is not likely to occur and mm -hmm. also causes minimal damage, yeah. maybe we can prioritize that a little bit later. There's, there's all sorts of methodologies and thoughts behind how you prioritize based on that ranking. Some mm -hmm. folks might want to prioritize anything that's a critical impact. Some folks might want to target things that are highly likely, regardless of the impact. Sure. Uh, so that's really what the model is there for. It's, it's to simplify and break down, you know, the the risk levels and the severities of, of those issues to a manageable, you know, single value, right? Sure. Uh, let's uh, sort of wrap it up here with uh, with the cybersecurity caveat, <laughs> which uh, it, it's always there, and I think you've alluded to it. Nothing is perfect, um, and, which means nothing can make you entirely bulletproof. But that doesn't mean threat modeling is worthless. In fact, it can make you a much, much more difficult target. So can just sort of to wrap up, can you summarize some of the ways that it does that? Yeah, I think the the biggest one, is what's commonly known as defense in depth. Yeah. Um, so doing threat modeling, modeling is another security activity that allows you to understand the threats, where those threats may occur, how they impact your system. So combining that with other services bolsters your, your entire security portfolio and security posture. But a big thing to also consider here too is that the nice thing about threat modeling compared to other security activities is that it can be a paper-based exercise. Hmm. You don't need a running application. You yeah. don't need source code. You can just talk to people as we talked to at the interview process. We can look at design documentations and say, hey, before you actually go design this, this is a threat you might want to consider and a control you might want to build. So as opposed to trying to fix something after it was actually already deployed, you can do a threat modeling exercise as early as the ideation and design phase and making sure that when you build it, you're building it properly. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, maybe you built something already and you're going through iterative changes and you want to make sure that the new changes you're adding are, are adequately being addressed. So threat modeling then gives you that, that big perspective. Um, and then the nice thing as well, too, one of the things that we actually push for 
is you can use threat modeling to aid in other security activities. So if you look at like a source code and a pen test, you can pinpoint, hey, this threat model said that these controls might be weak here. Let's look at the code. Okay. Or, or they were missing this control here. Let's try to pin test it, see if we can actually exploit that flaw that we found in the design phase. So um, the, the use cases are, are endless, uh, as we kind okay. of talked through a bit and allude to in the paper, but it's really about understanding the risk, uh, addressing that risk and identifying what controls and mitigation tactics should be in place. That's awesome. It's, uh, it should make everybody want to read the white paper. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, thank you. And, <laughs> And th so thank you very much, Chris. Thanks for, we've had four really good conversations about this. Uh, and thanks to your audience for joining us. And remember, you can find previous episodes of this discussion and you can download the Threat Modeling White Paper for free at synopsis.com. But uh, until then, once again, I'm Taylor Armerding with the Synopsis Software Integrity Group. We help organizations build trust into their software. <laughs>